Good evening. And welcome to the Mark Twain Library. Oh, <laughs> someone is wildly waving their hands at me. Apparently, I'm not supposed to be talking yet. So, <laughs> um, wow. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just start, and, um, and I'll keep talking till she waves her arms at me again. <clears throat> it takes a minute for our guest to turn into Mark Twain, so um, we're going to give him that minute. So, I'm Jen Wastrom. I'm president of the Mark Twain Library, and I welcome you all here tonight. We are um, so happy to be welcoming our founder back to these walls. Um, but the reason we're doing that is because Reading is celebrating its 250th anniversary, the Sester Centennial, for those looking for a crossword word. Um, in 1767, Reading was incorporated as a town. Prior to that, uh, our the town's founder, John Reed, had moved up here. And it took him a while to kind of create the, the farm homestead that he did. But in 1767, there were a 1,000 people here. And therefore, Reading became a town. That was 250 years ago. So the town is celebrating. Thanks to Julia and Alice Smith, we have a town-wide celebration with all the town organizations planning something. And the historical society. Of course, and the historical society. <laughs> Winging it, we are. Um, <laughs> um, but the library's piece of the Sester Centennial was, of course, to bring back another one of Reading's more celebrated residents. We have John Reed in 1767. We have Mark Twain in 1908. Um, in 1908, Twain came here because his biographer, Albert Bigelow Payne, lived here. Twain had been looking for a biographer and was very um, persnickety, about, persnickety about the one that he chose. But he finally settled on um, Payne, and Payne lived here. And Payne would get on the train in Danbury and chug all the way into New York City to sit there with pen and paper while Twain talked. And it would take forever for him to get to and from. And finally, Twain said, you know, where do you go that it is so meaningful to you that it takes half a day for you to get here? And Payne said, you ought to come see. It's pretty nice in my neck of the woods. And so Twain hopped on the train. It stopped for the first time ever in West Reading. There was not a train station there. He got on a little stagecoach, um, got to Diamond Hill Road, where Albert Bigelow Payne lived, looked around, and said, holy moly, it is way more beautiful than I thought it would be. And within a year, a summer house was built for him. And he named it Stormfield, and he decided to be here in the summers in New York City in the winters. But um, that was the summer of 1908, and it must have been a beauty because he never left. He said, sell my house in New York. I want to stay here for the rest of my life. And so he did. And when they were moving him from New York to Stormfield, they moved all of his books, and there simply weren't room. Wasn't room, sorry. And um, his neighbors by that point had embraced him and he them. And he said, you know what? I've got books. You don't have a library. Let's build one. And so he donated 3,000 of his own volumes to build the Mark Twain Library. He had a caveat, however. He said, if you all want this, you all are going to build it. I'm not giving you the money to build the library. I'll give you the books, but I'm not giving you the money. Um, and so just as we do today, <laughs> the Mark Twain Library <laughs> banks on its volunteers to uh, roll up their sleeves and, um, and roll them up they did. And you're sitting in the hardworking effects of that effort. Um, that was 1908. Today, um, he's back. He's back to check on us. <laughs> he's back. Um, Gavin Wilson is an extremely talented gentleman born in Bermuda, um, studied acting in London with the BBC, but saw Hal Holbrook do Twain in 1985, and it changed his life. 
And he set about the business, and I mean set about the business, to become Samuel Langhorn Clemens in performance. Um, and he did, and he does, and he's been doing it for 20 years in Bermuda and all around the world. In 2015, he won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Bermuda Arts Council. He's, um, he is amazing, and he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Twain. Excuse me. Uh, 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 thank you very much for attending the services this evening. I, uh, I very nearly didn't make it myself. I came by railroad. It was a slow train. Stopped every 30 minutes to catch its breath. And I became so incensed by the delays that when the conductor came around, I gave him a half fare, customarily used for children. Are you a child, he said, glaring at me? No, not anymore. But I was when I got on your damn train. <laughs> well, before I came out this evening, somebody announced, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Twain. That was done at my request. So often I've come out onto a stage and a platform has been most humiliating to have people pointing and muttering to themselves. Who's that? I don't know. I think it's Mark Twain. No, he's dead. <laughs> well, we're about to find out. It's not very encouraging, is it? In fact, it's downright depressing. But until I can find another introduction, it will have to suffice. I was asked this evening to deliver a lecture, and I've declined to do so. I've attended many lectures in my life, and they all seem to have the same thing in common. I came, I heard, I fell asleep. <laughs> in an attempt to avoid this from happening this evening, I've called tonight's performance an entertainment, on the off chance it might be one. I've entitled it Reminiscences and Other Lies. Reminiscences, because I believe that is the longest word I can pronounce without taking a breath. And the phrase, and other lies, was a comment by this management following a review of my material. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to a man whose great learning and veneration for truth is only exceeded by his high moral character and majestic presence. I refer in these very vague and general terms to myself. <laughs> I consider introductions unnecessary, but if one is to have them, I prefer to do the act myself so I can ensure in getting in all the facts. I was born modest, but only in spots. That soon wore off. I was once introduced to an audience by a lawyer, kept his hands in his pockets. Introduced me as Mark Twain, a humorist, a fellow who was really very funny, a very rare creature indeed. Well, I was struck speechless by this complimentary thunderbolt. Scarcely in my entire life had I heard a compliment so beautifully phrased, or so well deserved. But I have a much rarer creature in our midst than a humorist who is funny. We had a lawyer who kept his hands in his own pockets. Oh, but I, I do enjoy compliments. We all do. Humorous, burglars, congress, all of us in the trade. The personal column of the newspaper is a good place to put your compliments. I do it all the time. I need to. It's not very expensive. In fact, I could do it right now. I could say that today there are two most remarkable men. Kipling is one, and I'm the other one. Between us, we cover all knowledge. He knows all there is to know. I know the rest. <laughs> I had a compliment which came to me indirectly from a Montan young Montana girl. She was in his room in which there was this large photograph of me hanging on the wall. And after gazing at it for a while, she said, we've got a picture of John the Baptist too. <laughs> Except ours got more trimmings. I suppose she was referring to the halo. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you don't mind if I smoke. I know there's a whole group of you out there trying to do away with this pastime, but I'm doing the best I can to get you annihilated. <laughs> mind you, I have nothing against abstinence, as long as it doesn't harm anybody. Practice it myself on occasion. Make it a rule never to smoke when asleep. Not that I care for moderation. I do it as an example to others. And to prove that I'm not a slave to the habit, I can give it up any time I want to. I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> First time, I was a boy, about 10 or 11. He told me smoking would shorten my life by about 10 years, so I gave it up one day for, I don't know, two, 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 or, three, two or three hours. But at the end of that time, I realized that the decade wouldn't be worth living with no smoking in it. So that was that. I smoke anything I could lay my hands on. Smoke the leg off that chair if you could stuff the backy up it. But I normally just smoke pipes and cigars. Though one time I did try one of those new cigar wreaths. It was a short tube of flash paper, loosely packed tobacco up inside. I followed the instructions, stuck one end in my mouth, set fire to the other, inhaled once, and my mustache burst into flames. <laughs> I was most fortunate to vacate that incident without further disassembly. So I just smoke pipes and cigars now, more sedimentary road to my own demise. I did give it up on another occasion. This time it was on the advice of my doctor. I'd be confined to my bed for several days with the lumbago. And finally the doctor said, look here, my remedies haven't got a chance considering what they have to fight besides the lumbago. You smoke extravagantly. You eat all manner of things that disagree with each other's company. You drink two hot scotches every night, don't you? I said, yes, I do. I only drink them as a preventative of the toothache. <laughs> I've never had the toothache. <laughs> now, I don't ever intend to have the toothache. He said, that's all right, but you've got to moderate these things. And I said, I can't, doctor. And he said, why can't you? I said, because I lack the willpower. I can cut them out entirely, but I cannot moderate them. He said, that would be the answer. So for three days, three nights, I cut out all these manner of things. And at the end of that time, the lumbago was discouraged and left me. I was a well man, so I gave thanks and took to these delicacies again. <laughs> well, I had an opportunity to recommend this remedy to an elderly lady friend of mine who'd been going down and down to the point where medicines no longer had any benefit. I said, look. I can cure you in a week. All you've got to do is give up drinking, smoking, and swearing. In seven days, you'll be on your feet. Well, she said she couldn't give up drinking, smoking, and swearing. I said, why not? I've never done any of those things. <laughs> so that was that. <laughs> she had neglected her habits. She was a sinking ship with no freight to throw overboard. <laughs> Why, one or two bad habits might have saved her, but oh no, she was just a moral pauper. Um, I've, um, I've, I've forgotten what I was going to say. You know, I'm, I'm going to forget the Lord's middle name right in the midst of the storm, and I need all the help I can get. So I have some reference notes. I asked someone to bring them down for me. Oh, there they are. They're there all the time. I need my reference notes. I need my reference notes. I find it's very difficult to be nostalgic if you can't remember anything. <laughs> you know, we all have that innate ability to learn from our mistakes, and I have a feeling we're probably going to learn a lot tonight. At least I am. You know, nothing can be more infuriating than to be in the midst of a heated argument and then suddenly realize you're wrong. <laughs> Personally, that's never happened to me, but I can't speak for you. I've always been asked, Mr. Twain, why do you wear this white suit? 
Well, I've been very fortunate. I've been in the company of kings and princes and common ordinary folk. And everywhere I go, I've noticed that clothes do make the man. Clothes do make the man. Naked people, I found, have had very little influence on society. <laughs> One time I went into this billiard parlor and I started knocking the balls about, thought I was doing pretty good till the proprietor came along. He was a red-headed man. I've never seen such hair except burning on the end of a torch. He said, would I like to play? I said, yes, I would. He said, well, knock the balls about. Let's see how you can shoot. So I started knocking the balls about, thought I was doing pretty good. And he said, uh, that's all right. Um, I've seen enough. I'm going to play you left-handed. Well, it hurt my pride, but I played him. We banked for the shot. He won that. And I got ready to play, and he started playing. And I started to chalk my cue, you know, to get ready to play. And he continued playing. And I continued chalking. He played. I chalked. Finally, there were no balls left, and I turned to him, and I said, that's wonderful, perfectly wonderful. If you can do that left-handed, what can you do right-handed? He said, not a damn thing. I'm a left-handed man. <laughs> you know, nothing irks me more than storytellers who interrupt themselves every five seconds to ask whether or not the listeners heard the story before. And I remember this uh, incident with that great actor, Henry Irving. And he asked whether I'd heard a certain story, and I shook my head politely and said, no, no, I haven't. So he launched into it. Three seconds later, he stopped. Are you sure you haven't heard the story? No, no. Three times, three times he stops to ask whether I heard the story. And finally, I turned to him, and I said, Mr. Irving, I can lie once. I can lie twice for courtesy's sake, but I cannot lie three times. I not only heard the story, I wrote it. <laughs> I, oh, I've, uh, you know, I suppose over the years I have invested and lost thousands and thousands of dollars in various contraptions. And I remember one time after a series of bad investments had temporarily tempered my enthusiasm for technology, I was approached by this tall, young, awkward-looking man with a mysterious device under his arm. I listened to what he had to say and shook my head, said, no, I'm not interested. But he said, Mr. Twain, you can have a bigger share as you want to for just $500. No, no, I've been burnt too much. Tall, stooped figure started away, and I looked after him. It was a pathetic sight. He said, what you say your name was? Bell, he replied, Alexander Graham Bell. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, I can remember the exact turning point in my moral development. It was a day in my youth when I stole a watermelon from a farmer while he was attending to his customers. Now, stole is a harsh word. I, I removed that watermelon. I retired that watermelon and I retired with it. But to my chagrin, it turned out to be unripe. Well, the moment I saw it was ripe, I began to reflect upon my crime. If you do not reflect upon a crime that you commit, that, then that crime is of no use to you. It might as well be committed by somebody else. I said to myself, what ought a boy to do who has stolen a green watermelon? What would George Washington do? The father of my country, the only boy, I can never tell a lie. What would he do? Well, there's only one right and proper thing for any boy to do who's stolen a green watermelon. He must make restitution. He must restore that stolen property back to its rightful owner. Well, as soon as I made up that resolution, I stood up spiritually refreshed. And I walked forward, and with arms outstretched, I handed the watermelon back to the farmer. Made him give me a ripe one in its place. <laughs> the following, I think, is an example of, you notice that anything I say has absolutely and totally no bearing about anything I'm about to say. And so the evening continues. This, I think, is an example of unconscious humor. 
Man receives a telegram saying his mother-in-law is dead, shall they bury, embalm, or cremate her? He wired back, if that fails, try a dissection. <laughs> I was uh, raised on the banks of the mighty Mississippi River. And I suppose by the time I was six years old, I had probably about half a dozen narrow escapes from drowning. One time I was pulled out of the river in a very sad and soggy condition and everybody was most upset except for my mother. She seemed to take it in her stride. As soon as I'd been drained out, reinflated, and sent on my way again, she was heard to remark, uh, I don't suppose there was too much danger. People born to be hanged are normally safe in water. <laughs> but I was walking along the street in Hartford. And I was approached by a derelict, and I sympathized with the poor fellow and offered to buy him a drink. Tramp said he didn't drink, just wanted something to eat. I said, well, I got something better than that. How about a fine cigar? He said, sir, I don't smoke. Can't you spare just a little bit of money for something to eat? I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Why, why don't I put two dollars on a show winner horse in tomorrow's race? And the tramp looked at me most indignantly. Sir! I might not be the most righteous man in the world, but I do not gamble. Surely can't you just spare a little bit of money for something to eat? I said, sir, I'm going to buy you a three-course meal if you let me show you to my wife. I wanted to see what happens to people who don't drink, smoke, and gamble. <laughs> uh, when I was starting out as a lecturer, I used to become so vexed by the bubbling introductions I used to receive from local community leaders that I did away with introductions altogether. Introduce myself, similar to what I did this evening. I think the one incident that suggested this might be a good policy was when a coal miner had been nominated to introduce me to a Nevada audience, and it was apparent this man could not construct a sentence with a verb in it. He introduced me with the following words. He said, I only know two things about this man. One, he's never been in jail. Two, I don't know why. <laughs> Which gave me the uncomfortable feeling he knew more about me than he should. But when I was a very young boy, I had this craving to own a toy wagon. And I used to pray to God every night that I might get one. But then I found out God doesn't work that way. So I stole one and prayed for forgiveness. <laughs> I was um, returning after a few days fishing up in the main woods. And I was seated in the um, smoking car on the train back to Boston. And I couldn't help confiding to the rustic old gentleman seated next to me about the 12 fish I just caught, and I confided with him. I, I, I said, sir, I, I know between you and me the fishing season is over, but back there in that baggage car is 200 pounds of the best rock bass you ever set your eyes on. Is that a fact, said the old country boy. And do you know who I am? No, I said, who are you? So I happen to be the state game warden. <laughs> is that a fact, I said. And do you know who I am? No, who are you, demanded the state game warden. Well, I happen to be the biggest damn liar in the United States. <laughs> oh, these um, two old ladies, they've been friends all their lives, I suppose, since childhood. Shared all kinds of little activities and adventures together. One time they were sitting in the parlor playing cards, and one turned to the other and said, I know you and I have been friends since childhood. Please, please don't be angry with me when I say I've, I've forgotten your name. Would you please tell me what your name is? And her friend looked at her for a long, hard minute. How soon do you need to know? <laughs> so this rector tells his congregation, next Sunday I'm going to deliver a sermon about lying. And in the interim period, I want you all to go home and read Exodus chapter 41 in preparation for my speech. So everybody went home, and the following Sunday, the rector asked for a show of hands. He indeed wanted to see how many of the congregation had read Exodus chapter 41. And all the hands went up. 
And the rector smiled. Exodus only has 40 chapters. <laughs> so I shall continue with my sermon about lying. I think one or two of us got to the end of, to the finish line before the rest of us on that one. I've, um, throughout my life, I've been called many names, many names. One that seems to pop up more often than the other is that Mark Twain is an irreverent man. Mark Twain is an irreverent man. Well, I've been called a lot worse, so I don't worry about it too much. But I was trying to think of an example of why that might be the case. And one example does come to mind. Several years ago, I took a trip to the Holy Land. It was in the company of a group of deacons. I cannot for the life of me imagine why I chose these holy men as my travel companions, but there be as it may. Off we went. We finally arrived on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And these holy men jumped up and down with excitement and anticipation to sail out upon its sacred waters. And they asked an attending Arab the price to do so. Twenty shekels. Good gracious. They jumped even higher and balked most vocally at having to part with such a mighty sum of money. Well, the Arab, in defense, reminded these holy men, Jesus Christ, your Savior, he walk on these waters. I said, well, I'm not surprised at those prices. <laughs> Father Thomas, Father Thomas is a friend of mine. He, at one time, he went into one of those lowly Boston taverns. He went up to one of the patrons and he said, Sir, is it your desire to go to heaven? Yes, Father, indeed it is. Good, go and stand up against that wall. He then went up to another patron, asked him the same question. Sir, do you wish to go to heaven? Yes, Father, join the gentleman standing up against the wall. He then went up to Mr. O'Toole, a most despicable wretch of a human being. Sir, do you want to go to heaven? No, I don't want to go. Am I to understand that when you die, you don't want to go to heaven? Oh, when I die, yes, I do. I just thought you were putting a group together to go now. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I once heard the celebrated Jim Blaine tell his remarkable story about his grandfather's old ram. Now, Jim Blaine had that sort of memory that was so good it could defeat any, any attempt he would make to march a straight course. And any time he came across the name of a person or thing that had absolutely nothing to do with his story, he would stop and tell all about it. And as he plodded along, he would get further and further away from his grandfather's remarkable story about the old ram. I found him sitting on an empty powder keg smoking. My grandfather got that old ram from a feller up in Siskiyou County, fetched him home, and shed him loose in the meadow, and went down the next morning to look at him and accidentally dropped a 10 cent piece in the grass and was bent over fumbling in the grass looking for it. And the ram, the ram, he was up the slope taking notice. But my grandfather wasn't taking notice because he had it back to the ram, don't you see? And Smith, of Calabaris was standing there. No, wait a moment, it wasn't Smith of Calabaris, he was a Baptist. It was, um, it was, who was it? it was Smith of Tulare County, yes, of course it was, perfectly clear. Smith of Tulare was standing there. Smith of Tulare. Smith, Smith. Smith. Oh, right there. Smith of Calabaris was a Baptist. No, 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 no. Uh, the ram, the ram was up the slope, and my grandfather was right here, bent over, fumbling in the grass, and the ram noticed that attitude, and down the slope he come, 30 mile an hour, his eye full of business. But my grandfather, he, he had his back to the ram, don't you see? It wasn't Smith of Tulare, it was Smith of Sacramento. <laughs> Of course it was, Smith or Tulare was just a nobody. 
But those Sacramento Smiths, why, there's no better family in the old southern United States than them Sacramento Smiths. No better blood south of the line than them Sacramento Smiths. Oh, one of them, um, one of them married a Whitaker. What do you say to that? One of them married a Whitaker, Mariah Whitaker. There's a girl for you. Just as sweet and gentle and lovely. Generous? Why, if she had a thing, if she had a thing and you wanted it, you could have it. Have it and welcome. She had a, she had a glass eye and she used to lend it to Flora Ann Baxter that didn't <laughs> have any to receive company with. Now, Flora Ann was quite large, and the eye didn't fit. It was, um, it, it was a number seven. And she'd been excavated for a 14. So the eye, eye just wouldn't lay still. Every time she winked, it would sort of roll over. But it, it was a lovely eye. Showed her no purpose. It was painted a lovely blue on, on, on the front side, you know, the side you looked out of but it was gilded on the back side. <laughs> Didn't match her other eye, which is one of those browny, yellowy eyes, you know, quiet and tranquil, you know, like those eyes are. But uh, what no matter, they seemed to work out all right and plenty picturesque. Why, when Flora Ann got excited, that hand-painted eye would take a whirl and the other eye would look right at you. And the more excited she got, the faster the eye would start whirling, flashing blue and yellow and blue. And grown people didn't mind, but it, it made the children cry. <laughs> um, uh, it was quite scary. Well, Flora Ann married, um, married a missionary. No, she didn't. No, no, who was that? That was Sally. Little Sally, little Sally Hagedorn. Yeah, she married a missionary. And they, they, they went off to the other side of the world, in the middle of the ocean on some island, taking the good word to the cannibals. And they ate her. <laughs> yeah, they ate her. Ate him too, which was unusual because they didn't normally eat the missionaries, just their families. And when the families sent down to get their things, they said they, said they were sorry that um, it wouldn't happen again. Um, it was an accident. Accident. There ain't no such thing as an accident. And no such, such thing happened in this world that's an accident. It, everything that happens is for a divine purpose and for a good purpose. No, sir. No such thing as an accident. Well, you take a look at my Uncle Lem. That's all I ask you. You take a look at my Uncle Lem and then talk to me about accidents. Why, my Uncle Lem and his dog were downtown one day, leaning up against some scaffold and sick or drunk or something. And an, an Irishman with a heart of bricks was up the ladder round about the third story and his foot tripped and down he come, bricks and all, and hit a complete stranger, fair and square, and knocked the everlasting aspirations out of him. He was ready for the coroner in two minutes. People said it was an accident. No accident about it. It was a special divine providence with a special and mysterious purpose behind it. You see, the idea was to save the Irishman. I mean, if the stranger hadn't been there, the Irishman would have been killed. Well, people say, well, what about the dog? Why wasn't the dog appointed? Why didn't the Irishman hit the dog? Well, for a very good reason. Dog would have seen him coming. Uh, you can't hit a dog with an Irishman. What was the name of that dog? Jasper. Said, Jasper, mighty fine dog, too. Nothing common about Jasper. Jasper was a... Uh, a, a composite, which is a dog that's made up of all the good bits of the dog breed, like a syndicate. <laughs> where, did, where did Uncle Lem get Jasper? Oh, from the Wheelers. I reckon, Wheelers, yes, I reckon you heard of the Wheelers. 
No better blood shout than the lion than them whalers. Oh, no better blood. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear. Oh. Oh. Old man whaler. Old man whaler, he, um, what did he do? Oh, he worked in a carpet factory. And um, one, um, one day he was meditating and dreaming, and the, and the machinery made a snatch at him. And the next thing you know, Wheeler was meandering all over the factory, going faster and faster, to finally you couldn't see him. You'd just hear him whiz as he went by. Well, no man can have an experience like that and expect to return to his starting point in the same condition he was when he left. So Wheeler was wove up into 39 yards of the best three-ply carpeting. His widow was sorry. She was uncommonly sorry. She loved him very much, but she couldn't bear to roll him up. So she laid him out flat the whole 39 yards. She wanted to buy a tunnel for him, but there weren't any tunnels for sale. So she boxed him in this beautiful box and stuck it up on its end. I mean, it was about 60 feet high. So it was like a memorial and a grave. So I suppose it was quite economical. And she painted it on the side to the loving memory of Millington G. Wheeler, go thou and do likewise. Well, at this point, Jim Blaine always fell asleep, so he never ever found out what happened to his grandfather's old ram. Uh, uh, you know, standing on the world's literary stage, one is always approached by people who say, Mr. Twain, are you the man who said giving up smoking is? I say, yes, I am. I am the man who said it. In fact, I might be the most famous man to have said it, but whether or not I'm the first, I don't know. We're always borrowing sparkling comments from each other. That's called plagiarizing. <laughs> Mind you, you take a whole bunch at once, it then becomes research. But nothing annoys me more than to read a quotation written by Anonymous. Because so often that quotation is so rich in texture and profound beyond common thought and to be relegated to the corner of anonymity is a total travesty. So, I've loaned my name to the great cause. So any time you read a quotation written by Anonymous and you like it, it's funny, it's witty, it's entertaining, think of Mark Twain. <laughs> I won't mind. Indeed, one of my most favorite is always, always attempt to do the right thing. It will gratify some but astonish the rest. I thought that was very clever and entertaining. Then somebody told me I'd written it. I just forgot. Even Caraticus, the barbarian who revolted against Rome, is one of a long list of historical characters accredited with the slogan, Death Before Dishonor. Except modern scholars believe he probably just meant it alphabetically. <laughs> People do say the stupidest things. They really do. And we haven't got a clue. A word to the wise. A word to the wise. It's not the wise who need the word, it's the stupid. <laughs> I was reading a newspaper the other day, and uh, on one page there was the article, and on the other there was an advertisement promoting a product that removed blood stains. Well, at the time I didn't have any use for this item, but I couldn't help but thinking that if I had a shirt covered in blood stains, and perhaps laundry wasn't my biggest problem. <laughs> I was a newspaper man once, in spite of trying to find honest employment. But talking of newspapers, every time you pick one up, every time you pick one up, you notice it's always full of every known and unknown cures for every known and unknown ailment. A load of snake oil. I was reading one the other day. This one was spouting off statistics. And we all know about statistics. 
we have lies, we have damn lies, and then we have statistics. <laughs> and this is one of them. Four out of five people suffer from debilitating diarrhea. Four out of five people, good gracious, good gracious. But that does suggest that maybe one of the five actually enjoys it. <laughs> I'm always being asked, Mr. Twain, how do you spend a normal day? Well, I've never had one of those, but normally what I do is I go out, buy a newspaper, turn immediately to the obituary page, go up and down the columns, and if my name's not listed, I carry on as usual. <laughs> so far, so good. I insulted a local politician the other day. He was a sanctimonious old iceberg. Looked like he was waiting for a vacancy on the Holy Trinity. And his wife was of such girth, she appeared to have worked her way through one famine and was now munching her way through another. <laughs> and I insulted him. And it was suggested I might do well and walk a mile in his shoes. So I thought about that. I thought about that a great deal, as I intend to insult him again. But then I thought, well, wait, wait a moment. This time, I'll be a mile away, and I'll have his shoes. <laughs> this, is, um, this is a copy of Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I wrote this, and uh, I've been told recently that it's now considered a classic in American literature, and that is most gratifying, most humbling. But I'm also aware that a classic is a book that everybody talks about and nobody reads. And I'm taking a page out of that notebook, because tonight I am not going to read to you from Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. No, I'm not. I'm not going to read to you. I may be getting old, and I may be getting hard of hearing, but I'm damn sure I heard a sigh of relief somewhere in this room. <laughs> well, at this juncture, it behooves me to inform you I am the only man alive who understands human nature. God has put me in charge of this branch office, and when I retire, there'll be nobody to take my place, won't need to be, because when I get over to the other side, I shall use my influence to have the human race drowned again. <laughs> and this time, drowned good. No emissions, no arc. And indeed, every morning when I pick up a newspaper and read in it the basenesses, depravities, hypocrisies, and cruelties that make up civilization, I spend the rest of the day thinking what a pity it was Noah and his party didn't miss the boat the first time round. <laughs> in my considered opinion, I think the symbol of the human race ought to be a person carrying an axe, because everybody has one concealed about him somewhere and is always seeking to grind it. If I had been helping the Almighty when he invented man, I think I'd have started the other end. Start human beings off with old age. How much better it would be to get the bitterness of age in the beginning. Then you'd have that joyful prospect of looking forward to a joyful youth. Well, well think of it. 18 instead of 80. Well, it's only logical that life should begin with old age, with all its privileges and accumulations, and end with youth and its capacity to enjoy such advantages. I mean, as things are now, in youth, a dollar might buy a hundred pleasures. You can't get it. When you're old, you can get it, but there's nothing worth buying with it. <laughs> oh, the Almighty made a poor job of it. He should have invited my, my advice. Because there are a lot more improvements to be made in our species. Man has got to be the most ill-equipped creature to roam the face of the earth since the dodo. We haven't heard much from it recently. Man can't sleep out of doors without catching pneumonia, the rheumatism, or the malaria. He can't hold his breath underwater for more than a minute without drowning. Can't climb a tree without falling out and breaking his neck. He is the clumsiest excuse of all creatures on earth. He's always got to be clothed and housed and swathed and bandaged and upholstered to exist at all. 
I mean, he's a rickety sort of thing, any way you look at him. A regular British Museum of Infirmities and Inferiorities. He's always undergoing repairs. Well, take a look at the lion, the tiger, the leopard. Then take a look at man, bald-headed, glass eye, porcelain teeth, and an ear trumpet. A creature who is patched and mended from top to bottom. He has just that one stupendous superiority, his intellect. A man can be as stubborn as a jackass when it comes to using this great gift. Some observers hold that there is no difference between man and the jackass. But to my mind, this wrongs the jackass. <laughs> now, you may say I take too dim a view of my fellow man, but I would like to remind you. Man was made at the end of a very long week when <laughs> God was very, very tired. <laughs> I, I was listening to this pompous man spouting off the other day. It reminded me of an observation I made many years ago. Sometimes it's best to keep your mouth shut and assume that you're stupid and to open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> People do say the stupidest things. They do. I mean, for example, if you lose something, there's always going to be somebody who comes around and says, it's going to be in the last place you look. <laughs> well, of course it's going to be in the last place you look. <laughs> Why would you keep looking for it once you've found it, for God's sake? Love makes the world go round. No, it doesn't. It's whiskey, and it makes it go round twice as fast, too. <laughs> In order to hit your target, shoot first, then call whatever you hit the target. You'll find this very useful in life and improves your aim enormously. <laughs> I often wish I had the mind of a child. Friends and critics alike suggest I do, in spite of my feeble attempts to defer the onset of puberty. But sometimes it is a child who brings us down to earth. Now, we're reminded of a friend of mine who's a school teacher, attempting to teach children the concept of getting into heaven. And she said, if I had a house and I sold the house and I gave the proceeds to the church, would I get into heaven? No, 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 chorus the children. All right, well, what if I worked for the church? And I, I cleaned the pews, swept the aisles, trimmed the hedges. Would I get into heaven? No, 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 no. Oh, dear. Ah, what if I loved animals and I gave sweets to the children? Then surely I would get into heaven. No, 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 from the children. Well, then, how do I get into heaven? And a little boy, six years old in the back, jumps to his feet, his arms waving wildly. You've got to be dead. <laughs> Yes, I did. I, I did forget about that one. I remember uh, thinking of myself as a schoolboy. I wasn't very good. I wasn't good at anything, actually. No, I was good at uh, failing exams and getting into trouble. <laughs> Teacher, point a ruler. At the end of this ruler, there's an idiot. I said, well, which end? <laughs> the exams we used to have were most peculiar. They one of the great achievements of ancient Romans. Well, learning to speak Latin, I would thought, be one. Question two, where was Hadrian's wall? I always believed it went around his garden. <laughs> Question three, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? I said, well, at the bottom. <laughs> that was considered almost a blasphemy. You know, being a man has advantages, but being a woman has advantages too. Women can cry in public. They can wear from a wide assortment of clothing. Best of all, they're the first to be rescued off sinking ships. But there are some disadvantages. Women have to work twice as hard as men to be considered half as good, but fortunately for them, that's not very difficult. <laughs> you know, I have visited the United Kingdom of Great Britain on numerous occasions, and I have come to the conclusion that therein lie four different races. You have the Scots, who keep the Sabbath, and anything else they can lay their hands on. <laughs> you have the Welsh, who pray on their knees and on their neighbors. 
You have the Irish who don't know what they want and are prepared to die for it. <laughs> and then you have the English who've been a race of self-made men have thus alleviated the almighty of an awesome responsibility. <laughs> I was in Hartford recently. And I went into one of these, it was a magnificent municipal building and I walked into it and on the right side, no, no, it was on the left side, it was on the left side. There was this bulletin board, and it was divided up into three sections. And the first section was a, um, a series of upcoming social events. And the middle, there was a list of, of trials. And the third was made up of a photographic gallery of, of wanted criminals. And a young schoolboy was standing there staring at the photographs. And he pointed at one, he said, is he a wanted criminal? An attending policeman leaned over and said, oh, yes, indeed he is. We very much would like to get our hands on him. The little schoolboy pondered this and said, well, why didn't you keep him when you took his picture? <laughs> I'm always being asked, Mr. Twain, why don't you give advice to the youth? I am the last man on earth who should give, give advice to the youth. When I was 14, my father was the most ignorant person I'd ever come across. Mind you, when I was 21, I was quite impressed how much he'd learned in the interim period. <laughs> I don't know, what, what could we come? Ah, the darkest time of night is just before dawn. It is, it is, that is the darkest time of night. So if you're gonna steal something, that's probably the best time to do it. Eat a live toad first thing in the morning, and it's the worst thing that will happen to you for the rest of the day. <laughs> if, you, um, if you tell the truth, then you don't have to remember anything. That's the truth. This young boy approached a barber shop. Barber saw him come and he said, here comes the stupidest boy in town, watch this. Young boy came in. Barber put his hands in his pockets and withdrew them. And in one palm there were two dimes, and the other were there were two quarters. He said, "Boy, come over here and choose one." Boy came over and looked at one, looked at the dimes, looked at the quarters, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he took the dimes and left. But I tell you, stupidest boy in town. Well, later that same day, one of the one of the customers who had seen this incident saw the young boy coming out of an ice cream shop and called him over and said, young man, I witnessed the incident this morning. Please explain to me. I don't know. How is it you had the opportunity? There were two dimes in one palm and two quarters in the other. You took the dimes. Why? And the boy licked his ice cream. Said, well, the day I take the quarters is the day the game ends. <laughs> You know, it's always a good policy to tell the truth, unless you happen to be a damn fine liar. And then there's that ability to distort the truth, to twist it. So it's um, like a, a gnarled arthritic claw. I'm very good at distorting the truth. I've had formal education. I've watched Congress in action. But I would like to, by way of example, show how to distort the truth. And by way of that example, I offer up Caroline McCoy. Now, Caroline McCoy is a um, friend of my wife's. They were both uh, members of the same literary club back in Hartford. And Caroline was doing some research on her family, and she came across a cousin of hers, Congressman Reed Harrison. Now, Reed Harrison, in turn, had a cousin, Remus. Remus Harrison, horse thief, train robber, hanged him in the Montana Territory, 1889. Well, the only known photograph of Remus was in the possession of Caroline. And it was taken on the gallows. There it is, there's Remus on the gallows. And on the back, there was an inscription that said, Remus Harrison, horse thief sent to the Montana Territorial Prison in 1885, escaped in 1887, captured by 
the Pinkerton detectives, tried, found guilty, and executed in 1889. Well, Caroline sent this photograph with the inscription off to the good congressman to see whether she could, she could get additional information about their villainous relative. Well, the weeks and months went by, nothing happened. Finally, a letter arrives, a letter from the congressman, beautiful letterhead from the office of the congressman, etc. But it wasn't from him personally, it was from someone in his office. Now keep in mind, this is an example of how to distort the truth. I, you know, I know you know that, I'm just saying it so I can figure out what it is I'm trying to do. And the letter said, Madam, in response to your query about Remus Harrison, we offer up the following. Look down further, it's Remus Harrison. Remus Harrison was a famous cowboy whose business empire included the acquisition of equestrian assets and intimate dealings with the Montana Railroad. In 1887, he devoted several years of his life to government service <laughs> before returning to resume intimate dealings with the Montana Railway. In 1887, he was a key player in a vital investigation run by the renowned Pinkerton Detective Agency. But in 1889, sadly, Remus passed away at a public civic function at which he was the guest of honor <laughs> when the platform upon which he was standing collapsed. <laughs> Oh, now it's time to go. My feet are tired and your, you are tired. I came in in 1835 with Hallish Comet. It's coming again pretty soon. I hope to go out with it. It would be the greatest disappointment of my life if I did not go out with Hallish Comet. The Almighty surely remarked, these two indefinable freaks, they came in together. They must go out together. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. But back to more pressing matters. There is no worse death than to be talked to death. <laughs> and I fear your lives are in imminent danger. <laughs> I bid you all good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your warm response. It fills me with joy. It fills me with happiness, just like the gentleman returning from the wee hours of the morning from his club. He too was full of joy. He too was full of happiness. But there was his house spinning around like a top. <laughs> And as he approached it, the house went faster and faster till finally he had to plunge onto the stoop. But the house continued on his wobbly journey, so he fell through into the bottom of the stairs and he tried to stand up. The house took a lurch and he had to climb up on his hands and knees. And when he reached the landing, he tried to stand up again, but again the house took a mighty lurch. He collapsed, rolled all the way back down again and landed at the bottom with his arm wrapped around the new post and said, God bless all the sailors out at sea on a night like this. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> That's our founder. <clears throat> <laughs> and we're mighty proud of him. Um, but he, he had another stipulation besides that the folks of Reading had to build the building. Uh, at the time that he moved here, his books were being banned. And so he said to the Mark Twain Library Association when he founded us that we were never to be a municipal library, that we would always be an association library, that we would always depend on the people of Reading to make this place great. And so while we do get help from the town of Reading, we go and ask every year and we get a generous grant. Um, but we need to make roughly $250,000 this year just to keep the lights on, pay the staff, 
and do things like this. So we're especially appreciative that you're all here tonight. We hope you will continue to support him and his amazing legacy as part of this town. What a gift. Um, Mr. Twain will turn back into Mr. Wilson and be upstairs at a reception in a few moments. But before we adjourn, I'd like to invite his wife, Linda Wilson, up to the stage. Thank you, Jen. The past couple of days here have been amazing. We've had such a great welcome from everybody at the library. We've met incredible people. We've learned so much about Mark Twain that we didn't know. And we've had an opportunity to see things and hear things that have really deepened our knowledge of Mark Twain and certainly the library's commitment to Mark Twain. There's a lot of interest in Bermuda about Mark Twain and the time that he spent in Bermuda. And there's a lot of interest in Reading about the time he spent in Bermuda because he returned from Bermuda to Reading and passed away in Reading. So Bermuda was his last trip. What we hope to do going back to Bermuda is to try to bring together the Bermuda Reading story and bring together something that will be rich for Bermuda and for Reading. I'd like to present Jen um, a gift from Bermuda, and it is Mark Twain in Paradise, and it's his voyages to Bermuda. Oh. And hopefully, we can work together to find out a lot more about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. You're very welcome. It has been my privilege, the library's pri privilege, particularly Pam Roby, who made the connection that brought the Wilsons here. But when you go upstairs to the reception, you will see they are as delightful and a whole lot easier, I think, than <laughs> Samuel Langhorne Clevin. <laughs> so let's turn up the light so people can find their way upstairs. Thank you. Pardon? Oh, I just want... Uh, Oh, I'm so no problem, no, no problem. Um, part of what we did on this trip was um, we got to visit the um, uh, got to visit the home of the DeSantis uh, Stormfield. We very much appreciate you opening your home to us, Beth. We very much appreciate the tour that you gave us, complete with an architectural map, so Beth could answer all the questions that we sh that we had. Um, so that was hugely exciting. We also got to meet Susan Durkee. Susan, thank you so much for the lovely portrait that you gave us of Mark Twain. We will cherish it forever. And finally, I would like to thank Pam Roby, who put together so many of the details to make our trip so comfortable and so delightful and so rich an experience one will always remember. Pam, thank you very much, and I've got a little gift for you if you'd like to come up. Pam? Okay, and I think we can all uh, join each other for drinks upstairs. Thank you.